The rest of us, if you would, stand with me and turn your Bibles to the book of Philippians once again. And we will be in Philippians chapter 2. I want to read to you two verses that I already read this morning out of verse 12 and 13 of Philippians chapter 2. And then we will back up and go to the beginning of the chapter. But the Apostle Paul, writing the church there at Philippi, um, they're writing from a prison cell there of Rome, uh, says there in verses 12 and 13, he says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. If you would flip back with me to verse 1. He says, Now if therefore... If there, rather, be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other but better than themselves, looking not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. And we are going to continue to read, but we read it this morning or referred to it. It says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and hath given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity just to gather here in your name, to be able to study your word, and Lord, to be able to magnify you. And Lord Jesus, I just pray that as I look to your word, that you'd hide me behind the cross. Help me to preach here tonight. I pray help us, each one, to be people that will hear what you have to say to us as individually and as your church. And I pray, Lord, that uh, whether it's those here in the sanctuary or those uh, in another place, in the, within the sound of my voice, I pray that each and every one of us would be mindful that you are a living God who is working in our hearts and that we should be listening to what you have to say tonight. And Lord, we just love you and we thank you that you are a real and personal God who is constantly active in our lives, even when we are not worthy of it or even when we are not really considering um, the closeness we need to be with you. We just ask you to continue to do a work that only you can, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we uh, talked about working out the salvation that God has provided in our life through faith in Jesus. And as we started talking about that this morning, we seen a few things that Peter had to say in 2 Peter that the grace of God is sufficient, not just for the salvation of our souls or the forgiveness of sin or the process or the act, I guess, of justification, uh, the pardon of our sin. Um, God's salvation and His grace is sufficient for what He's doing in the here and now as we're anticipating being in His presence forevermore in a perfect state. And so I think sometimes as we think about our salvation, I think we can get uh, the idea that it's a one-time thing. And again, I don't believe you have to keep getting saved over and over and over again, but we need to understand the threefold um, idea, if you would, of salvation. We think about it. Um, I think that you can think of it kind of the, the triangle, if you would, 
Um, I think a fellow by the name of Paul Enns in his systematic theology book uh, uses this kind of, of a illustration. But if you had a picture of a triangle, on the one side of the triangle, you would have the word justification. That is the first part of the threefold uh, work of salvation in a person's life. Justification is the forgiveness of sin, and it is a one-time event in a person's life when they put their trust and faith in Jesus. So it is something that if a person is saved, it is something that happened one time in their life in the past, and they are declared innocent, or they are looked upon just as if they never sinned, the idea of justification. And sometimes people think, well, I got saved, and that's it. Well, that's the first part of your salvation. Then you enter in the second part, and that is the process of sanctification. And that is that when a person gets saved, they're declared no longer guilty of sin, but pardoned of that sin and given the righteousness of God, as well as the presence of the Holy Spirit of God who takes up residence in their life. He makes a home in the inward part of a believer. And he is now, we are now the temple of the living God and he begins a work in our life. And that work is the process of sanctification where he is making us more like himself. He is shaping us and molding us as described in the scripture as the potter and the clay. And he is working from the inside out and he's shaping us and molding us into the person of Jesus Christ, meaning the characteristics of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, we are to begin to reflect as children of God, adopted children of God, the character, the nature of God as He works in our life. And this is a process. We start out as babies in Christ and we mature in the faith. Now, when we think about justification, it is a one-time act by the grace of God where our sin is forgiven, cast as far as the east is from the west, cast into the depths of the sea of forgetfulness to remember it no more. We are clothed with the righteousness of God. That's not to say that we don't need forgiveness as a saved person throughout our saved life, but as far as the act of uh, initial salvation and pardoning of our sin, remember God died on the cross for our sin, and when he died on the cross, all of our sin was in the future, right? Because he died almost 2,000 years ago. So when we trust in him and he forgives us, he forgives us of all of our sin because he's a God who knows the beginning from the ending. But as we are living in real time, as a saved person, there's times that we need to ask for forgiveness. But justification is a one-time thing where God himself brings about that act in our life. Sanctification is a partnership. It is a work that starts through the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life as he makes you to become alive in Christ. That's something you and I really have no part in. But then as we become alive in Christ through faith in Christ, then we're able through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to cooperate with him as we obey the word of God. So we're going through the process of sanctification. So when we talk about working out our own salvation, as it says there in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 2, he's not saying work for it. He's saying work it out. He's saying you take your saved life and you begin to exercise your faith. You begin to grow in your faith as you cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. So you're going through the process of sanctification. Now, the last part, if you would put a title on the other, the last part of the triangle, so you got justification, sanctification, and making up the third part, we, we are looking forward to the act of glorification. Now, this is another part in which God himself alone is a part of. We can't do that part. We get to be participants in the process of sanctification, but we couldn't forgive ourselves, and we're not going to be able to change ourselves as far as the physical flesh will one day be changed. 
And so when we think about glorification, we all are in, a, uh, in this earthly tabernacle, as the Bible describes it. And when you talk about a, 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 the term tabernacle, we think about the term as a tent. And when we think about a tent, we're thinking about a temporal dwelling place. Well, this body is just that. And thank God for it, right? It's temporary. And, and right now, you might be thinking it's fine, especially some of you younger folks may think that it's fine uh, the, how, how you are. But the older you get, you begin to realize that this body is not a, oh, what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of self-confidence you've got, eventually you're going to realize that it ain't all that. It's just like this morning, I was there in Sunday school class and was coming out and I was a little bit stiff and I said, man, I am just stiff. My back is stiff this morning. I have no idea really why. Didn't really do a whole lot yesterday. Um, yesterday was uh, one of a few days that I'm not doing a million things, it seems like. Didn't have to do a whole lot yesterday. Slept real good, I felt like, last night. Man, I got up this morning, didn't sleep funny on my, anything that I could tell. The man just going about, my lower back is just stiff. And Grant just kind of reminded me, you know, you're getting older, son. That's just what happens. And you know what? That's the facts. But one day, this old fallen body that's been affected and tainted by sin that is dying from the time of conception will one day have to be put aside. Whether it's by means of death, or Jesus comes and raptures the church, either which way this body is going to be set aside and the saved individual will receive a glorified body, one that's not affected by sin, one that's going to be made in perfection, one fashioned like unto the resurrected Lord, one that's going to be able to be in the presence of a holy, righteous God and experience him in the fullness of his glory. One, when there's going to be no sickness in that body, there's going to be no issues with that body. There's going to be no faults, no failures. I, you can't even imagine it. It's going to be perfect. And that will be the complete salvation of the individual from the justification or the pardoning of one's sin to the work or process of sanctification wherewith the believer works with the Holy Spirit in accordance to the word of God to make us more like Jesus. And then the end of our salvation, if you would, the completion of our salvation is when we get a glorified body. When Jesus talks about saving us, it's exactly what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter seven, that Jesus, who is a faithful high priest sitting at the right hand of the father, not only make an intercession for us, but has the ability to save us to the uttermost. See, as one old preacher said, from the guttermost to the uttermost, when you trust in Jesus, you get saved. And when he saves you, folks, he saves you completely in an entirety. And so when we think about working out our salvation, we see in verse 12 that we are to do our part in that process of sanctification in which we are in now if you are saved, you are in that process, and, and you may not be in the same part of that process as someone else. Some people are growing a little faster in maturity to be more like Jesus. Some are slower in their faith. And that's all depending upon how fast you want to grow up, you know? And, you know, we think about um, kids, you know, Julie used to look at AJ all the time and say, you need to promise me something. And he'd say, what is it, Mom? that you'll never grow up. Well, as a little kid, he'd say, okay. Well, he couldn't keep that promise, right? I mean, now he's about to be a senior. Now he's got more facial hair than I could ever grow, and he's just 17, you know? He's taller than I am. He ain't fat as I am yet, but he's taller. He's hairier. He, you know, he's, he's growing. He, you know, he couldn't be, couldn't stay little like he promised his mom because he's growing up, and that's what happens. And we might want our kids to, stunt their growth, so to speak. We don't want them to be sick or anything, but we may want them to stay little because that's what us as parents want. But your heavenly father desires for you to grow up in the faith. Oh, he loves when you're born again initially. He loves the brand new baby in Christ. 
He loves the baby in Christ. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels when one is born into the family of God. He loves that. But as he loves that, he also desires for us to grow up in the faith. And we have to work that out, folks. We have to be a people that are striving to be more like Christ as we're obedient to him through studying his word, through corporate worship, through personal worship, through personal testimony and prayer time and witness and ministry. All of these things help us grow up in the faith. We have to do our part in that. We also understand that there is an aspect in which God is working, as it says, for us to work it out with fear and trembling. And verse 13 says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so we, we must understand as well, trust the fact that God is working in us. Philippians 1, 6, the apostle Paul said to the folks there, he is confident. Being, he said, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will bring it to completion. Another way of understanding where it says will perform it is that he will finish it. You know, there's not going to be any uh, undone projects in the life of believers because God's doing the work. You know, probably everybody in this room has probably got a project or two that you started, but you haven't finished for whatever reason. You know, we've all been there, but that's not how God's going to do it in the life of a believer. It may take a little longer in some folks to mature than others based on their own personal cooperation and willing to work it out. But just be understood that God is going to bring it to completion. And let me, let, me, let me explain something, too, before we get to the beginning of chapter 2. That process can be as easy or as hard as you want it to be. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, we know the trial of our faith is going to happen, right? Because Peter tells us that. And he says the trial of our faith is more precious than that even of silver and gold, precious metals and stones. Because when we come through the fires of life, and we come on the other side of those fires, what happens in our life? We begin to realize that this world ain't worth hanging on to. And we start to realize that God's been faithful even through the fires. And we then grow in our desire to be with him, not only while we're here, but be with him for all eternity. So we're looking forward to his return. We're looking forward to us being with him. But we're going to go through the trials and our, our faith is going to be tried with fire. And we know that that's not going to be always good or easy. But God will bring us through it for the purpose of our maturity and our shaping and molding to be like Jesus. So we know that we're all going to face those things. But when I say it can be as easy, as hard as you want it to be, it's, it's like this. God disciplines how many of his children? All of them. And so based on your obedience to the word of God and the prompting and the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God, you can, you can make the determining factor on how easy or hard the process is going to be. Does God have to correct you? Does God have to prod you? Does God have to, uh, have to do some more work in your life to get you where he wants you to be because of obstinance, because of unbelieving, because of disobedience? You know, that's on you. That, that's part of the process in which you have control of. You may not have control of all the fires that you have to go through because God has a purpose and a plan. And whether you think it's best for you or not, I can assure you he does what's best. He's good, he's righteous, he's just, and he has a plan and a purpose. So you may not be able to move and escape from the fire, but you can limit the amount of discipline he has to bring towards you. See, it's like I tell my kids, you know, one time one of them said, I don't like your tone. I said, that's on you. Don't blame me. If I whisper and it gets done, I whisper. But if I got to get loud 
for you to listen and to do what I tell you, that's what I'll do. And if I got to get loud and start cracking the whip, I'll do that too. But you have the ability to, to make me react however you want or you don't want. But you've got to, you know, so when it comes down to our walk with Jesus, same thing goes there. God should be able to tell us and we do it. He should work in our hearts and prompt us through the word of God and the spirit of God. And if we're obedient, then we get to be part of that process with little to, you know, little to no real discipline. But if that isn't how we choose to go about it, he will correct. And so with that being said and us thinking about that, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, he says, fulfill ye my joy. So as we think about our own working out of our salvation, and we think about what God's doing in our life as he's working, we talked about the sufficiency that's there through 2 Peter chapter 1. But here I want us to see that, that as Paul is writing here to the church of, uh, of, of Philippi, and he himself is going through afflictions, he, he says, listen, you know, if there's going to be any consolation, it's going to be in Christ. If there's going to be any comfort of love, it's going to be in, in if for any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercy, he says, all this stuff is going to come in Christ. And I want us to understand that in our maturing of the faith, all the blessings that we get from being in Christ. I mean, when I say you're in Christ, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit of God, like I said, you get justified, your sin's forgiven, then you start through the process of sanctification. And, and right at the initial part of that, what happens? You are made alive. And then, as according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you are baptized. That means that the Spirit of God immerses you into the body of Christ. And you become one with Him. And you're in Him. And when you become in Him, there is consolation. There is comfort. There is fellowship of the Spirit. There are God's mercies that endure forever and are fresh every single day. And so when we think about the, our, our maturing in the faith, we get to experience these things as we're going through life. Uh, let me flip over to the book right before Philippians. And I will read to you out of chapter 1. And think about what, what Paul says to the church of Ephesus about being in Christ. Now, as he's writing here, he, he says a lot of things. In the first 12 verses, he's going to say things like, he's choosing us, he's chosen us. And he says, us, 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 us. And then in verse 13, he says this, and whom you also trusted. And so the Apostle Paul in the first 12 verses is going to say a lot of things about being elected. He's going to talk about being chosen. He's going to be talking about predestined. He's going to be talking about blessed with every spiritual blessing. And he's going to say he's chosen us. He's predestinated us. He has adopted us. He has done all these things, us, 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 us. And he's not referring to the church of Ephesus. He's talking about him. I think he's talking about um, uh, the saved, the apostles. He probably may even be referring also to the saved Jews. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure exactly who always referring to when he says us, 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 but I think that's what he's talking about primarily. And then in verse 13, he says, and you also. So what he says is this, these first 12 verses was applying to us, but when you trusted in Christ, you were placed in that group. And, and I want us to see what happens when you become in Christ. Look what it says in verse 3. He says, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Right? Then he says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having Destinated us unto the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, 
to, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved or in Christ. We've been accepted in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his, that mean Christ, grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure, hath he had purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together and won all things in Christ. Both are in heaven and that which is on earth, even in him, and whom also we've obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So if he's referring to the apostles, initially, when he's talking about us, 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 those who first trusted in Jesus, whether he's talking about those in Jerusalem, those first believing Jews. But then he says in verse 13, you who believe, you get to be a part of that too. And so he says there in verse 13, and whom you also trusted when, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after you believed, look what he says, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest or down payment of, your inher of our inheritance under the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. And so what we find here is that these folks believed, and it says, look at all these blessings that come along with being saved. So as you're working out your own salvation, what, what, do you, what do you now understand and being reminded as Paul says to church Ephesus, he says also over here to church of Philippi, he says, you've been blessed with everything you have need of. We think about being, being sufficient to be the person that you need to be, as, as we see in there in 2 Peter chapter one. Uh, sufficient, God's grace is sufficient for us to, to live even in a corrupted world. We, we are, his grace is sufficient for us to, to produce the fruit that he expects us to produce in this life, as well as his grace is sufficient to give us assurance for the hope we have beyond this world. But over here he says, you know what? You also, his grace is sufficient and has given you every single blessing that you need. Every blessing. If you go to Ephesians chapter one, if you go over here and say, you know what? If you have any consolation, if there's going to be any consolation, if there's going to be a real comfort, it's going to be in Christ. How many know that when you go through this life, his grace is sufficient for whatever struggle, trouble, difficulty you have. He wants to give you a peace that passes all understanding. He is a God of all comfort, you know? And so many times we go through this life and it's difficult and it's hard but you know what? You're, you're able to experience a peace that passes all understanding because the God of all comfort, he wants to reach down and give you the consolation. He wants to work in your inward parts of your life to, to, so you can experience peace in the midst of turmoil. Paul's writing about this from a prison cell. Now, I find it interesting now, when he first went to Philippi, you remember what happened to him? He was thrown in jail, right? Paul and Silas were where? In jail. Remember what they did when they were in there? They sung about it. They praised the Lord, right? And, and what happened? You remember God heard in the middle of the night, was the earthquake takes place, uh, whatever it is, and all of a sudden the doors open up. And that Philippian jailer just assumed, I mean, I can understand his assumption everybody's escaped the, the jail that he's supposed to be guarding and taking care of. And, and what is Paul telling them? Hold on a second. Don't harm yourself. We're all here. He's about to kill himself because he knows that if he let them all out, he's probably going to be put to death anyway. So he's just about to go ahead and, and, and take his own life. And Paul says, don't do nothing to yourself. We're all here. And that Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And you know what? Paul didn't have to say it for the first time. I can assure you that the apostle Paul and old Silas, they weren't just singing songs of praise. They were preaching the gospel. 
And that old Philippian jailer needed just a little clarity. What is it now that I must do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And I tell you what, your whole family can be saved. And that Philippian jailer got saved. His family got saved. They followed Christ in believers' baptism. And then the Spirit of God came upon them. But I found it interesting that he is there at Philippi and he was in jail there for the gospel. And now he's writing an epistle back to him and he's sitting in a jail cell. And the apostle Paul, maybe you would think, got tired of being in jail. But you know what? He learned to be content in whatever state he was in. He learned to have comfort. Why? Because if there's any comfort, it's not found in your circumstance. It says it's in Christ. You don't have to go around here discouraged and depressed and defeated. No, because there's victory in Christ. There's comfort in Christ. You know? And so as you're maturing in the faith, I think one of, one of the characteristics of a mature person is being able to tap into this comfort. You know? To have a peace. I'm not talking about somebody who's just, I don't care about nothing. I'm not talking about that. Okay? I'm talking about somebody that, like Paul, whatever state he is in, he learned to be content because he understands if there's any consolation, it's in Christ. If there's any comfort of love, it's in Christ. If there's any fellowship of the Spirit, it's in Christ. If any bowels and mercies, it's in Christ. You know, a person who is growing and maturing in the faith is it growing in these experiences, the fellowship of the Spirit, the comfort of God's love, the consolation of Christ, the mercies of God. We grow in these things. Number two, he says, uh, as he tells the church of Philippi, I want you to fulfill ye my joy. <clears throat> but he says that ye may be like-minded having the same love being of one accord, one and of one mind. He says, listen, another thing about growing in the faith is being able to be in unity with other believers. He's speaking to the church as a whole. He's not just speaking to the one individual, even though the one individual's got to hear the truth and has got to apply it to their life. It's kind of what I talked about this morning. When the individual takes hold of the word, if we all make a decision that we're going to take heed to the word and apply it to our own life, then what happens is that it affects our family. It affects the church, right? It affects the groups we're a part of. And so when we all make these decisions, it's going to affect the body as a whole. And what's Paul says, he says, I want you to fulfill my joy. I want you to top it off if you would. And, and remember, Paul, Paul understands that joy is not based on your circumstance. It's based on a person, and that's the person of Christ. He understands that. So you can have joy unspeakable and full of glory no matter where you're at. If you're in a prison cell like Paul, if you're free, if you've got plenty of resources, if you're broke, if, if things are going good and you're full in your tummy, or if you're hungry, he learned whatever state he was in to be content, and he understood that joy comes from the Lord. That's what he understood. But he says to the church of Philippi, I want you to top it off. I want my joy to be overflowing. And how can you contribute to my joy being overflowing? I want y'all at the church to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of, of one mind. When, when you go over there, the very early church of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, you find that the early church was of one mind and one accord. They were in one accord prior to the birth of the church as the 120 were in the upper room waiting for, for the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as Jesus said, listen, you're going to be baptized with fire, not many days hence. So I want you to go on to Jerusalem and I want you to wait and 
When you're there, my spirit's going to come upon you. You're going to receive power from on high and you're going to be my witnesses. But they were in of one mind and one accord in the upper room waiting for the presence of the spirit of God to come upon them. As Jesus promised on the day of Pentecost, it came to pass and it moved upon them and the church was birthed. And then as the church started to go on, we see that that there was during that time, 3000 people got saved right in the day of Pentecost. When, when Peter preached and the others shared the gospel and 3,000 got saved. And then we know that the church, those believers were gladly baptized. And then the Lord started adding the church daily. But they came together of one mind, of one accord, of one love. They were in unity. It wasn't uniformity. They didn't all look the same. They didn't all dress the same. They didn't all have necessarily the same uh, preferences but they came together in one mind under the authority of the word of God. And they were able to come together in unity. You're talking about a group of people, initially all Jews, right? But it wouldn't be long before all of a sudden these Gentiles started getting saved. And what were you finding in the early church? Neither male nor female, bond nor free. You had slave and slave owner that were their believers in the church. You had rich, you had poor. You had Jew, you had Gentile. You had all kinds of different people and different walks of life that came together. How do you get a group of people like that together in agreement? It was tough initially. Some of these Jews wanting to make the Gentiles be like Jews when, when, when they had to start to realize that the things in which they wanted to force upon the Gentiles were nothing more than types and shadows that were pointing them to Christ. And when they trusted Jesus as the Christ, those things that were road signs pointing to the Messiah, those things had been fulfilled in him. And so there was no reason to push them upon the Jews. There was really no reason for them to have to continue on under the law like that. You could go ahead and observe some of those things just for the sake of it. But there was nothing adding to your salvation. There was nothing that was required anymore of ceremonial law or sacrificial system or anything like that. And as you read through the, the, the book of Acts, you'll find there's some debate down there. So how do you get these folks coming together? You got to get back to the word. And you gotta, you've got to understand as individuals, you say, you know what? The word of God is the final authority. So for the mature person, what does it come down to? You know what? I'm going to be in unity. Not, not unity for the sake of just unity. I'm not saying that. But we come together under the authority of the word of God. And as the word of God is the standard, guess what? We can come together in unity. You know? What, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, when you love one another, they'll know that you are my disciples. What they said. So when the world's out here looking and they see churches that are in unity, that's a testimony. When they see folks divided, fussing, splitting, all that stuff, there ain't one bit of testimony in that. You know? And I'm telling you, lost people will examine that stuff and they say, man, something's wrong with that group down there. They do. And, and so for us, as we work out our salvation and as God works in us to bring about his will and his purpose and his good pleasure in our life, one of it's going to be working out unity in our life. We get to experience things like comfort, um, consolation, fellowship with the spirit, the mercies of God. But then we also, from, from a group standpoint as well, unity, unity, you know, over the 20 plus years of ministry, I'm telling you, as a pastor, there's plenty of times. May you pray for this right here. You pray hard for it. Because I've been around long enough that, man, when discord is there, it is a mess to try to serve the Lord. By yourself, let alone with a group of people. You pray hard for it because... This is important. Unity is important. That be, he says, he said, fulfill my joy that you be like-minded. 
that you're on the same page. You know what? Sometimes I pray that we just get in the same book, let alone the same page. Huh? I mean, that, that's hard enough, but at least if you can get them in the Bible, I mean, at least you got something to work with, right? But, but if you can't get them even in the text, in the scriptures, then it's hard to get somebody on the same page, you know? I've had conversations with folks, and they'll say, well, I know what the Bible says, but, and I'll say, that's the problem. We might as well end the conversation. If the Bible ain't going to be your authority, if we have no desire to come to know the truth and line up for the truth, then this conversation has got to end. But if we can come together and say, you know what? The Bible, the inspired and errant and fallible word of God is the standard. If we can come together and come with an objective heart to say, I want to know truth and I'm willing to change if I need to change to line up with that truth and we can come together in that sense of unity... Hey, guess what? Oh, Satan gets tore all to pieces. Because what happened when you had just 11 on the same page? Man, he's tearing up Jack, wasn't he? I mean, you had Matthias come in there as you find the beginning part of the book of Acts. But I mean, think about it. Judas, one of the first of the, of the original 12, he, he, he's, he's just kind of a mole. He, he's not a born-again believer. He's in the group. But he didn't trust Jesus as the Christ and and, and all, we know all about him. And then you get over here and you get 12 that's going to lead. And if you put Matthias in the group, you got 12 that's going to lead at the very beginning there of the early church. And man alive, because they're on the same page. And as the church grows, what happens? You got deacons establishing in Acts chapter 6 and 7, you know, you start reading about that. You have the deacons placed in there where, where they can tend to the tables, if you would. For lack of better terms, they take care of some of the ministry parts that, that the apostles can stay more focused upon the word of God and the proclamation thereof. And, and the church then began to even flourish more. And they came together and, and, and under the apostles' teaching, the unity of the word of God. Now, today we have the completion of the word of God. And so from Genesis to Revelation, we have what we need. And we come together in that unity, saying that everybody agrees everything, every little issue. But I'm telling you what we ought to strive to do. We ought to strive for that. The Bible says, be at peace with all men as it lies possibly within you in Romans chapter 12. So be at peace with each other, you know, but also that we come together thinking the same way. Be like-minded. That's, that's why our culture has turned into what it's turned into. Because at one time, and I say at one time, not here recently, but at one time, this country, predominantly Christian. But you know what happened? We weren't like-minded. And when you, when you take a, a group of folks and don't get them on the same page, I mean, what, why, why is topics like abortion a debate in the church? Why is uh, what traditional family is, what the Bible says about a man and a woman, a husband and a wife? You know, how's that up for debate? You know, how is the act of homosexuality up for debate? How is, uh, um, when we start looking at things that goes on in our, in our culture, and we could talk about the alcoholism. We could talk about um, recreational drugs. You could talk about the act of gambling, the lottery, whatever you want to talk about. You could talk about these things. But when you sit back and look at it, you know there ain't a thing good in them. Yet we have debate and stuff in the, in the church about if it should be okay or not. And there's not really no real argument in the scripture for, for these things. People will try to take a verse here and there and try to make it out to be. But the reality is we have debates, the fussing over stuff that shouldn't even be up for debate, folks. Can't get on the same page on plain, to me, obvious stuff. You know? I mean, and then, and then we wonder, you know, we wonder. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. In fact, a lot of times 
things that really matter, the church, majority of the church, don't even have a stance on it. Afraid of controversy. Now, when it comes to some of the dumbest stuff that I've told you before, and then I'll get off the little soapbox, but, you know, color carpet, where the piano should be, um, all these other little silly stuff most of the time, what, what's your preference and style of music, um, you know, whatever it may be, you know, some stuff that doesn't even matter. That's what we'll stand on, you know. It's, it's silly, you know. I find most of the time you got major issues in church over minor topics, nothing major. I've really never been in a church squabble almost my entire ministry over a fundamental, essential doctrine in the faith. Never. I've never looked at somebody in the church that I pastored and them want to sit here and make a big deal or fuss with me over the virgin birth. I'm not saying it ever happened. Liberalism was big time uh, before my time. But I, I've, never, I've never had that. I've had nobody fuss with me over that. I've had nobody fuss with me and say, Brother Anthony, I don't like you saying the Bible's the inspired and there's infallible word of God. The only time I've heard anybody say anything, when I was preaching, I said something about global warming. And somebody over here, and wasn't in this church, somebody sitting over here, I didn't hear it. I'm glad I didn't hear it in the service. That's a good thing. Because I don't know how I responded. God just kept my ears stopped up. But fellow speaks out loud, love for Julie here, and says, uh, oh, he's a scientist now. Well, I didn't know nothing about it until I got home. At that time, I lived across the street from the church. So I got home, and Julie didn't wait long enough to tell me. And so she tells me about it. I have to look out the window, and that fellow's still over there in the parking lot. He ain't a regular member. He just a tender that time. But he is married into a family that was there all the time and members. Long time established family. So any which way, this same goes, dad was a pastor. His dad ain't pastor no more. But anyway, any which way, I, I'm there. I said, what? She said, I just calmed down. I thought, okay, I prayed about it for a few minutes. I said, Lord, I'm going to change out his suit and put me on something a little more comfortable. And if that guy's still over there, every time I get done, I'm going to go talk to him. And he still was there when I got my shorts and shirt on. And I walked across the street, and he's parked in front of the church, and I down on his passenger side of his car, and, and I looked in there. He said, am I in the way? I said, oh, no, you're not in the way. I said, I just wanted to talk to you for a minute. Um, I never claimed to be a scientist. His eyeballs got real big. I said, but I know what the scripture says. And uh, I, I said, I, I just kind of went through a few things. I said, all right, just to simply say, that fella is about the most that I've had to deal with from inside the church. Now, I have some folks get mad at me when I preach against alcohol, especially when there was a wet vote, wet dry vote going on in Manchester. Some folks got mad about it. They didn't have enough, uh, much, no, enough backbone about really talk to me, but they just, you know, like most folks do outside, out behind your back and grumbling and cause problems that way. But, but real fundamental things, never, really. Never hear anybody say anything and say, I just don't know about that. You know, never. But what does the church a lot of times do? Our mind's somewhere else when it's stuff that doesn't even matter. And it causes issues. We, Paul says, fulfill my joy. Be like-minded. Be Have the same love. How do you do that? You love like Jesus loves. You take on the mind of Christ. You become in unity based on what God says is important to him. And then he says in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Nothing be done through strife and vainglory. Let me tell you something. I've been a pastor for a long time, and listen, I've dealt with this. 
There's been plenty of folks do stuff with the pure intent of strife. And they may not call it vainglory, but that's exactly what it is. But the intention of strife. Paul says that those that are working out their own salvation, those that are being worked in through the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit, they're going to get to experience things like consolation, comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, and the mercies of God. They're also going to strive to be in unity, and what they're going to stay away from is doing things with the intention of strife or division. You know, you got folks that, that, that is, you know, I don't know the intent behind it. I can't say that. But there's problems by folks who want to call strife and division. Let me tell you something. God hates when folks try to bring disharmony amongst the body of Christ. He says, don't do that. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But he says this, but in loneliness of mind, humble yourself. It's not about us as individuals. And the neat thing about it, when you do what God says and you put him first and others first, then you're going to be took care of too. Because as you're taking care of someone else, they're going to have, they're going to, the other folks will be thinking I'm going to take care of them. When we put ourselves out of the way and we esteem others better than ourselves, then all of a sudden we're showing the love of Christ and we're doing the work of Christ. And you're not doing things through strife and vainglory. He says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. He says, don't be concerned about yourself. Be concerned about others in a healthy way. I'm not talking about envy and covetousness and stuff like that. I'm talking about not looking upon other people like, man, look what they got. How come I ain't got that, you know? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about looking upon others, ministering to others, worrying about the needs of others more than ourself. So when you start to be like Christ and he's working on you and your characteristics start to reflect him, guess what you're going to do? You're going to put others above yourself. Isn't that what he did? I mean, ultimately, isn't that what the cross is all about? Jesus didn't die for himself. Jesus didn't leave glory for himself. Jesus didn't take on human form for himself. Jesus didn't endure the temptations of the world for himself. Sure didn't become our sin for himself. And he did not go up on the cross of Calvary and, and allowed himself to be nailed there as a sacrifice and a substitute for himself. Right? You can't be a substitute if you're for yourself anyway, and you're there. It is about others. And so Jesus was there for you and for me. While we were yet sinners, he commended his love toward us. He died for the ungodly. He died for the helpless. He died for the hopeless. He, as the good shepherd, was looking for the lost sheep. And so when we began to reflect him, more in our life, guess what? We're going to have that same, we're going to start to have that same mentality. We're going to be concerned about others more than ourselves. And he says, that's why he says in verse five, let this mind be in you, which is in, which also, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we've already referred to these. And so we'll just look at it quickly again. But he says, you know, he was confident in who he was who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus was confident in who he was. He is God, always was God, always will be God. And when he took on human form, he didn't cease being God. And so when he says before Abraham was, I am, he was completely confident in who he was. When he makes a statement like that, I and the Father are one, and the Jew says, this man is guilty of blasphemy for he's making himself equal with God. Jesus was completely confident in that. Why? Because he is God, the second person of the Trinity. For us, guess who we need to be? We need to have confident, 
our, have self-confidence in Christ. Our self-worth, our confidence, you know, needs to be found in Christ. I mean, when you, when you understand you're a child of the king, when you understand you're a joint heir with Jesus, when you understand that you have overcome the world in him, when you understand the greater is he who's in you than he that's in the world, when you understand you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, when you understand nothing can separate you from the love of God, when you understand that he who does begin the good work and you will bring it to completion, when you understand all of these things, shouldn't you have some confidence in that? Now, as you have confidence in who you are, then it allows you to take on the mind of Christ in which you make yourself of no reputation and you take on the form of a servant. And as he was made in the likeness of man, you submit to what God wants for you in your life. And then you become obedient. He says, being he says, being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. So we take on the mind of Christ that you and I are to be obedient unto Jesus and do his work no matter what the consequence may be. So when you're confident in who you are in Christ, you can take on the role of a servant and be obedient no matter what the consequence because you, you have your confidence in just like Abraham did. When Abraham was taking Isaac up there on the mountain to sacrifice, he said to the young lads that was with him, you, you stay here. Me and Isaac's going to go up on the mountain sacrifice and we'll be back in a little bit. We will be back in a little bit. What Isaac didn't know, what those other fellows didn't know, was Isaac was the sacrifice. But Abraham was confident that the promise was coming through Isaac. And that promise was that his seed was going to be multiplied to the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. And through his seed would all the world be blessed and the promise of Messiah had to come through Isaac. So what was he doing? He was trusting in the word of God. And so if you have confidence in that, when you're going up the mountain to the place of sacrifice, guess what? You know, like, like Abraham did, something's got to happen. And even if I have to offer him, he's going to be raised back to life. Well, he had that confidence. When we're living for Christ, we can have that same confidence. Not only do we see that, but do you find that he exalts those who humble themselves before the mighty hand of God. Well, he exalt. Right? And that's what he says here. It talks about Jesus. He says, wherefore, talking about God the Father, also hath highly exalted him and has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, bow the things in heaven, the things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. When you read it over in the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3, and I should, can't think of the top of my head exactly what verse it, but the Bible speaks about us receiving a new name. Okay? He talks about us being kings and priests unto our God. He talks about us ruling and reigning with Christ during the millennium. It talks about uh, the, the, the one day those of us who are faithful and serving him will receive rewards. No, no, our name is not going to be lifted above Jesus' name. He's God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's the one who became a man. He's the one that lived sinless life. He's the one that paid for our sin. He's the one that rose from the dead. He's the only way in which we, any of us can have eternal life. But... As we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God in due time in his way, he will exalt us. We don't have to worry about nothing else. You know, and I'm not saying that you and I should be living for some type of exaltation, but the Bible plainly teaches us, listen, you don't have to worry about the praise of men because in due time, God will exalt you. So you do what you're supposed to do. And so when we think about living for Christ as individuals, as families, as a church, we don't need to be worrying about, hey, is, you know, is my name being recognized? You know, 
Is, is, is this and that going on? You know, I, I'm telling you, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter. We're, we we want to see God do a work, but we should not be motivated for self-recognition, the church being recognized, or any of that. It needs to be about is the name of Christ lifted up. And as we're doing what Christ wants us to do for his honor, for his glory, we'll get to ride his coattail as he's lifted up. And we trust in that. And so tonight as we think about our own growth, you know, in our own personal walk and us being shaped and molded to be more like Jesus. How about your own consolation? What about the comfort of love in your life? The fellowship of the Spirit, experiencing the mercies of God, you know? Can you say that, that you're growing in those things? You know? If not, how come? How come you can't say, man, the fellowship of the Spirit is sweeter today than it was before? See, when you first get saved, the Spirit of God comes into you. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 says there's a time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. When a person first gets saved, they're babies in Christ. And what's the necessity there? There's a necessity. There's an emotion there. I'm not saying that the emotion is a bad thing. It's a good thing. But when you first get saved, the burden of your soul is lifted. You, you feel that relief. You experience a refreshing through the presence of the Holy Spirit. There is a feeling that goes along with it, okay, that changes. But as you grow in the faith, you're not depending upon all the butterflies. No, you get to grow in the fellowship of the Spirit where your love for Christ and experience with Him grows deeper than just a little butterfly and the feeling that's there. And that's why I think that, you know, us, you know, in certain denominations, sometimes us Baptists, we sit around there like we're bumps on the law, you know, and we maybe have some, some solid sound doctrine and teaching, but we still sit there kind of like, bless me if you can, you know, because we're worried about, you know, just some an emotional experience. And, and, and I think we, we miss out on some of those things because of us being reserved, too reserved. But then on the other side of that, I, I see folks that, that get all excited and all this emotional experience and all this hoopla. And, and, and I mean, you think, man, these folks are having one doozy of a service, yet they don't have a clue what they believe and why they believe it. They don't have a clue about what's being said or preached. Most of the time, the pastors don't have a clue what they're saying. And folks are running and shouting and flopping and flipping and everything else. And they say, this is of God. And it's, it's got to be a balance. There's got to be a balance in this. Hey, sound solid doctrine. I don't think you want to get up out your seat from time to time. Hello? You know? But you ought to be growing in the fellowship of the Spirit. When you're going through some of the difficulty of life, guess what? I'm not telling you, telling you you should be all excited about it, but you ought to be growing in your comfort. You ought to be growing in the consolation. And you ought to experience the mercies of God in a way in which you're saying, you know what? I don't like necessarily this, but at the same time, God's doing something in me. And I can't explain it, but it's going to be okay. You know? Are you growing in that way? Are we being in unity together? Are we making sure we're not here just to fuss? Are we taking on the mind of Christ? What about you tonight? You know? It's, uh, it's, it's important that, we, that as we think about our, our spiritual growth, it's, it's an ongoing thing. And so we see these passages, we have to see, hey, am I growing in this? You know? Am I, am I growing, am I different in a good way than when I first started? You know? And, and listen, the, the, the crazy thing about it is, and I don't want to try to discourage you with it, but the crazy thing about it is he's always going to be working on you. 
You're never going to completely arrive until the end of our salvation complete with the, with the process or the act, I guess, of glorification. You know, when he changes to give us a new, a new body. Okay, so, so from justification to glorification, this process of sanctification is a continual work. And as you get this area lined out, all of a sudden he's going to shine on another area. And I'm thankful he don't shine on it all at once because <laughs> that'd be bad rough. But he takes the time of, of working it out as we cooperate with him. And he, and he begins to make us more like him. And so are you growing in that? I'm asking Brother Dwayne and Lula to come as they lead us in a song of invitation. I say, what are you going to do in your own personal walk? You know, as a church, you know, are we growing that way? You know, because listen, we want, we want pews full. We, we want to be able to reach more folks. But you know what I learned sometimes? Sometimes God knows if you're ready for that. You got to be, you, we got to be ready for that, you know. So we can, we can send you to, to, to be prepared to be able to, to reach and not only win folks to Jesus, but to help them be in a place where they can grow, you know. A healthy church will multiply. But we've got to grow in that. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you tonight. We ask you to move during the invitation. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the work and the presence and the person of your Holy Spirit in our individual lives and collectively as your church. And I ask you to continue to work during this invitation. And may we take heed to what you said to us as we thank you that you are still speaking and you're still working. And may we not take that for granted, but instead uh, be obedient to you as the prompting of the Holy Spirit has worked in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.